let's start by talking about obviously the turmoil that is uh, gripping the, the the cryptocurrency space right now. Uh, how do you see this turmoil different from what some have described as the you know the crypto winter of 2018 when Bitcoin crashed? Uh, what what lessons did we learn from that, and and what is your outlook uh, for the the crypto space given uh, the, the the turmoil we're seeing on the markets? Well, I think the turmoil, you know, from say, you know, like four years ago, is very different from what we see today for a couple of reasons. One, I think people may may have forgotten, you know, Bitcoin was like three thousand dollars, Ethereum was like at some stages under a hundred dollars, and one of the reasons behind that is that really back then. Uh, the activity in crypto was purely for speculative reasons because there was no utility. People weren't building sort of metaverse experiences. Uh, you know, NFTs weren't a thing yet. You know, people weren't building games. The whole ecosystem hadn't yet matured. Uh, today, even though obviously, you know, what, what happened particularly with Terra, which in itself I think was faulty, but you know, we don't have to discuss the details on this one, um, is uh, is is the fact that uh, this is sort of more contained. We think. And also at the same time, um, hasn't had really, uh, you know, broadly, even though there's a reduction in prices, hasn't impacted, you know, Bitcoin, Ethereum, or the entire sort of uh, blockchain ecosystem in terms of its utility. So in 2018, a lot of people basically exited out of crypto into fiat, which obviously sort of uh, collapsed, uh, sort of collapsed the prices. But today, you know, people aren't exiting into fiat per se. They're exiting maybe into other stable coins or into Ethereum or Bitcoin. Right. <clears throat> and what they're doing is they're continuing to build. Right, the number of people who are building and constructing in the space is far, far greater. And the economic opportunities for people building in, I right. guess what people describe, describe as Web3 is, is there as well. So it's much more stable than before. Well, we, we can talk a little bit about Terra UST because of being the source uh, of the latest turmoil. Uh, do you think there could be the positive impact that others uh, can, can see the, the algorithmic failures there that led to the depegging to the dollar and then, you know, find ways to prevent it happening to them? We've already seen other stable coins have this problem. Well, so I would say that the other stable coins don't really have the same problem because they're backed. Right. I think there was an attempt to uh, depeg uh, Tether, for instance, which failed. Uh, you know, Circle is backed, you know, one-to-one -to, -one to the dollar, for instance. The difference about UST was, in a sense, you could say it was an algorithmic experiment to basically create a purely virtual asset backed by another virtual asset that <clears throat> basically had direct correlation. And I think that's the point, right? The whole idea of sort of a, sort of a peg is to peg it against something that wasn't necessarily correlated. Uh, in this particular case, it was. So, so... So I think you could say that the model of UST was a, you know, the algorithm worked as planned, but it was uh, it was it was a, it was a faulty design, shall we say, right? So that's the difference here. Um, <clears throat> unlike USDC or Tether, it's the the sort of impact for UST Terra, which was perhaps even more Korean contained as opposed to sort of rest of the world, isn't widely used, right? Very few investments, um, you know, outside of Korea are done in in UST. Uh, it's uh, you know it's because Terra is very much a sort of a Korean ecosystem play for the time being. Most so I think there's going to be more impact in the Korean market. There's probably going to be more sort of shockwaves there. But from a global standpoint, I, we don't see it having uh, much of an impact, relatively speaking. Certainly compared to say four years ago, it's it's not you know I wouldn't consider that systemic or anything like that. Yet, how do you see the flow of venture capital money into the space, into your company as well? We have investments by KKR, George Soros, Winklevoss Capital, among many others. And we've seen you go from a unicorn status of a billion valuation to five billion. There's talk that perhaps there's another round of funding coming down the pike, at least rumored, uh, that could value Anamoka upwards of $10 billion. Does this pause in the market, does this uh, turmoil in the market uh, make some of the big venture capital funds kind of take pause as well as because we, we've seen some of the VC backers of, of those coins that have, have faltered being kind of pressured to backstop those losses. So I think broadly speaking, the space continues to grow, right? Uh, naturally, you know, when, when there's a market downturn, there's always hesitation. I think we're not talking about specifically just in crypto. There's just a macro factor right now where people are a little bit more cautious. One of the things that's interesting is that people who understand the space 
continue to invest quite actively, like ourselves. In fact, we think of this as a buying opportunity, frankly speaking, just because our lens is not the next six months or 12 months or you know three months. Our lens is what happens 10 or 20 years down the road, right? Uh, and so there's, you know, one like, like even if you look at back sort of the, the during the dot com sort of bust, as it were, you know, there were some great buying opportunities, frankly speaking, when that happened. But it's not even comparable, right? Like, you know, when people talk about sort of, oh, look at what happened to say one of our portfolios like Axie Infinity. Well, you know, but you know, they still had two hundred million dollars of cash, a billion dollars worth of treasury. It's a very different calculus here. Uh, these companies, especially the big ones, are very sort of very well sort of financed, right? Like the sandbox as well is doing incredibly well. NFT sales have have continued to do well. You know, that's the other thing. You know, we just completed, for instance, with Phantom Galaxies, twenty million dollars of planet sales, which is basically a non fungible tokens of sort of digital assets of you know virtual planets that people can sort of play in the metaverse. And we just announced that literally, uh, I think yesterday. So the, the space continues to grow, but of course, there's going to be a bit of a shakeout for those that are weaker players. That is always the case, you know. Um, you know, so I think I think in some ways you could say it's somewhat healthy, but the, continue, the space continues to sort of grow because you know we expect you know billions of people to eventually onboard into Web three. You talk about what the space is going to look like in 10 or 20 years, and I'm wondering, given that Animoca is both a game maker but also you know, acting in a kind of venture capital sense, right, in, in, in terms of taking stakes across different projects, which side of those businesses and business models do you think will be dominant in the years to come for you? Well, we're an operating company, to be clear, right? So the goal in everything we're building and constructing and also in what we're investing is to help build the businesses that we're supporting specifically. So when we make all these investments, the core of philosophy is to invest in things that add to the network effect of non-fungible tokens, as in digital property rights. Right? So it may not seem obvious that someone who's focused initially on blockchain gaming would, for instance, be supporting sort of DeFi lending protocols or NFT sort of lending protocols, as an example, uh, or even layer one or layer twos. But we do that because it aids in the network construction and in the facilitation of the growth of non-fungible tokens. Right? When we started doing this four years ago, most people didn't even know what an NFT was. So we had to basically invest in companies that can help grow that. That's how we invested in companies like Decentraland and OpenSea and Dapper Labs and you know, many sort of more household names today, of course, but back then were sort of really early companies. So I think you, know, you talk about 10 years, that's a long time, but we think Web3 is a natural evolution of the internet. Uh, we think that most of the world will have onboarded to that form of the of the web. And that's because we're already digital dependents today. I mean, we can't live without you know, our Instagram or Facebook or WhatsApp or WeChat, whatever that may be, except that we are dependents. We have no rights on these platforms. We don't own a stake in any of that, right? So we don't have a say. So the whole point about Web3 is that now we have ownership in that. We have the ability to have a stake and a voice in that. And in the future, you know, that's what we describe as the internet of ownership. That's the, that's the big impact here for Web3. And it's a better paradigm for end users because they get paid for their time. They get paid for their data. There is no reason uh, to sort of go for, I guess, a sort of an inferior model that sort of is not, um, and not respecting sort of the time and contribution we bring to all the networks today, which is not rewarded at all. We spend time on Facebook and Facebook doesn't pay us for any of the time we spend, despite the fact that we add so much value to the network. After all, if you all stop using Facebook, what is the value of Facebook? Nothing. So we are basically free laborers at this moment in time for platforms such as Facebook.